Good evening, everyone. It looks like we're live. Um, welcome to the um, end of month four of the Lady Darby read along. Um, and we are going to be talking about all things a study in death. So um, I'm excited to be here with you. And um, I've got some um, things I'm going to discuss. And I've had some of the readers on the um, Facebook group post questions I'll be talking about. And I have a few excerpts. I may read few, two short excerpts that um, some people have requested. So, um, but you have time to please go ahead and post your questions and comments, um, things you would like me to discuss about the book um, in the comments below. And I will be checking um, throughout the night um, to see um, what you would like to hear me talk about. And it looks like we are live. Good, great. Just checking that. So, um, Awesome. All right, so I'm going to dive right into it. So A Study in Death, book four, um, it's a bit of a departure from the earlier books. It kind of represents a shift um, in the series because um, Kira isn't asked to investigate by either friends or family. She actually um, kind of instigates the investigation herself. Um, she she takes the impetus um, when she's there and, she, and Lady Dr Drummond drops dead and, and um, she's suspicious and so it's, it's a shift in her investigating skills. It's, it's her exerting her confidence in that area and, you know, convincing Gage um, to investigate with her. And of course, they have a lot of pushback from um, sources, um, Lord Drummond himself and um, Lady Drummond's husband, who was a main suspect, and also from um, Gage's father, Lord Gage, who we get to meet for the first time, the infamous Lord Gage. Um, one of the questions I got asked is, um, is writing the villains part, is the writing the villain parts fun or exhausting? Um, like Lord Gage, he's so stunningly horrible. And yes, I love that description. Um, he was actually a lot of fun to write, I think because, um, they are so awful and you can have them say things and do things that maybe your um, more, your nicer characters who follow the rules, you know, these, these villains aren't someone you maybe would want to know in real life, but get to get to write them um, and to go into that is a lot of fun. And, and I also find it's very interesting. I try to make sure all of my villains are very three-dimensional and they have definite motivations that, even if we don't agree with their actions, we can understand where they're coming from. And so it makes them human to us um, and relatable. And so Lord Gage, you know, he's he's tricky because um, there's definitely parts of him that we have not explored yet, even this far in the series. And, you know, Kira being on the end of his, you know, he does not like her and he's horrible to her. And she is very protective of Gage and the way his father has treated him. So it's hard. We haven't seen as much of his humanity even yet. I mean, we've, get, we've get, gotten little tastes of it, especially when we get to book seven. But um, so he was a lot, a, a, a tricky balance, especially because we're writing from Kira's point of view and she doesn't necessarily want to give him the benefit of the doubt because of the way he is. So um, he was a lot of fun to write. So yes, definitely. Um, I, I kind of enjoyed the villains a little bit. Dep I guess it depends on the villain, but definitely Lord Gage is kind of fun to write. So um, I had another question about um, the hobbies for Gage um, that he does word working. Is it something I knew from the start? Um, actually, it's not. Um, I I don't know. I'm trying to remember now, but I do remember when I wrote The Anatomist Wife and I mentioned that he had calluses. I didn't exactly have it worked out why he had calluses. I actually had a different idea at first, and then I realized that I didn't like that. And so I, I, I then had it already written into the story, and so I had to figure out another way. And that was when I stumbled across the word working idea because I knew that it was something a gentleman wouldn't, you know, they weren't supposed to work with their hands. So it wasn't something he would share widely. And it also gave him a connection with his um, very proper maternal grandfather that I wanted to get to explore in a later book. So um, that's kind of where that came from. So yeah, it wasn't, it was not planned. I uh, actually had a little bit of a panic trying to figure out what I was going to do with that. And so um, I was glad the way it turned out, but initially, yeah, I should have, I should have planned that out better. So sometimes that happens. I like leaving things open. And then there's other instances where it's not the best idea to, to do that. So it's a balance. 
Um, uh, Kira and Gage in this book are a lot of, um, it was very tricky to write. I mentioned this in the group because they're engaged. We love them. But Kira is still anxious about getting married and giving control to Gage. And Gage, while he gets that Kira went through a lot and why, and, and the reason she's hesitant, he, he's still a man of his era. And so in this book, there's a lot of push and pull on that um, and them having to really get and come to grips with what the other experiences and to understand each other. And so uh, um, that was a very tricky point to have to um, write in this book that 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 relationship. Um, and it was also a lot of fun to have them building up, you know, getting excited about being married and, um, you know, all of that entail all that that entails physically and and emotionally and everything. So um it was definitely a tricky part of the book writing. But um there was some a lot of fun parts and um a couple of people asked about the scene where she wears her pink dress. So I'm gonna read a short clip from that. Uh, let's see. Gage and I passed through this door, passing our outer garments to a pair of footmen waiting to take them. I twitched the overskirt of my rose-colored gown into place and tried to tug discreetly at the deep V of, my, of the bodice, which was lower than I was accustomed to. I knew I was not in danger of spilling out, but that did not make me feel less exposed. I forced a tight smile to my face as Gage turned to me and paused. His eyes immediately swept up and down my figure. I glanced down at myself. Is something out of place? I whispered, smoothing my hand over the decorative detail at the center of my cleavage and down over the white lace belt. Gage reached out to still my hands. No, you look lovely. I'm just not used to seeing you in pink. I inhaled shakily. Alana convinced me to choose it. I bit my lip, glancing to the side at the throng of people passing us. Nonsensically, I felt the backs of my eyes begin to sting. I knew I should have insisted on the cornflower blue. No, you shouldn't have. I looked up, surprised by the conviction in his voice. His pale winter blue eyes looked decidedly warmer than their normal crystalline quality. That sight steadied me. You're sure? His gaze traveled over me one more time, leaving a heated trail everywhere it touched. On second thought, I don't want you questioning anyone tonight. You're going to remain firmly affixed to my side. I smiled. I'm serious, he told me, pulling me closer. I already want to plan a facer to every man who walks by and looks at you in that dress. I pressed a hand to his chest. Gage, no one is looking at me. His eyebrows arched. You truly don't know, he replied in, incred in incredulity. I frowned in confusion and his lips curled into a tiny smile. Come, he murmured, linking my arm through his and tucking me in close to his side. <laughs> Gosh, she truly doesn't get it. <laughs> She doesn't see, she doesn't see what others see, I guess. So, but that's understandable coming from the marriage she came from. So let me check and see if we have any um, questions or comments. Oh, la, yay, uh, lots of comments, which I'm, which thank you guys. I appreciate it. Um, yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I finished book 10, A Perilous um, Perspective. It's turned in the next Lady Derby. Um, it'll be out April 5th of next year. So the countdown can begin. <laughs> I know you love to hate him, right? You love to hate Lord Gage. Um, yeah, the, Kira, yes, Gage's um, scars, uh, or his calluses, not scars. Um, I did think about fencing, and then I realized it didn't really make sense. He would have been wearing gloves, and and yeah, um, I did, I did briefly consider that, but then I realized that didn't make sense. So, but it gave her something to kind of contemplate. Um, yeah, so <laughs> there's lots of interesting relationships in this book. Um, Lady Stratford is another one. Um, she's in The Anatomist's Wife, and um, I really felt like she was a character that I hadn't fully explored in that book. And I loved, I love leaving myself the open-ended things, especially if I'm not sure about a character. So I don't like to close the book on them unless I'm certain I'm done with them. Um, and so at the end of The Anatomist's Wife, I left it open. I had that scene, nice little scene at the end between the two of them. And when she came back, when Kira came to Edinburgh for um, before, I suddenly realized, I was like, I really need an, another character. And, and I'm like, she really needs a friend. I mean, Alana's her good friend, but she doesn't, we need some outside, you know, 
influence and I needed some information. And so anyway, I decided let's try Lady Stratford. And as soon as I started writing her, it was just so natural. It just fit. Like we never, it, it was one of those things where Lady Stratford, because of the marriage she was in and all the horrible things she was going through had hidden who she really was. And so in book four, we really get to see who she is, that she doesn't have to hide herself. And she and Kira just, it worked. And, and I loved her getting to have a friend finally. And that plays a lot into um, book 10, we're going to find out um, next year. So she, she, she's been a lot on my mind. So um, anyway, I'm glad that in this book that that worked out and, and I got to continue that, that friendship and um, add some other friends for Kira. Um, so she has some other ladies, you know, on her side. So um, I also loved getting to delve into Philip more because um, I had a reader comment this, and it's very true. I was worried he was not quite as three-dimensional as he should be, um, because it was hard to get to delve into his character as much in some of the other books. We do get some good, great scenes with him. There's one, there's a great scene between him and Kira in Mortal Arts, um, when they're walking beside um, the, the Firth of Forth, and um, he wants her to let Gage help, and all those kind of things. Anyway, um, but we don't get a whole a whole lot of him. And I was worried he was almost too perfect. And so when I was writing and I knew that Alana's pregnancy was going to be in jeopardy, this has already been established, um, her life, um, that it was going to be dangerous delivery. Uh, you know, I was like, okay, well, how would, how would Philip really react to all this? And, and I realized, you know, the way he is that he would not I feel like the way he reacts in the book is very true to he, what he might have been I mean that he was really scared when when Greer when um Alana had trouble with delivering Greer their third child it was sudden it was not expected and so he was you know rock steady because it was a crisis and he was there and that's what he's good at but with this fourth child it's there's such a buildup he knows for you know seven eight months you know as soon as she knows she's pregnant that um, that this is going to be dangerous. And so as they get closer, you know, he's, it, it's that instinct to protect himself. He can't control this. Um, like he controls so much else in his life. You know, he's an Earl, he's a Lord, he, you know, he, he controls everything around him and he can't control this and he's terrified. And so his instinct is to just distance himself, even though it's the worst thing he could do. And so um, I loved getting to wrangle with that and to make Philip more real and to and to make the relationship with him and Kira more um, three dimensional and also so that was another interesting aspect I liked exploring in this book. Um, I'd love to do more with Philip. I, I feel like I don't get to do as much with him, so um, that's something for the future. Um, uh, maybe I'll have to make him a murder suspect or something sometime. I don't know who else. Maybe that's a little too too on the spot. But anyway, um, let's see. And oh, yes, Bonnie Brock, I know is a big part of this book. Um, he is a very interesting character. Uh, I talked about with The Grave Matter that he was not, I did not anticipate him sticking around. And he does. And um, for book four, it was so much fun to get to bring him back and let him play into it. And them to explore the, you know, old town of Edinburgh with him and, and finding the chemist and his relationship with Kira and how he, he, you know, pokes half jesting, half serious that he's going to hurt Gage. And, you know, uh, there's a lot, a lot there to unpack. And, and Kira and his, his relationship is, is extremely interesting. Um, yeah, there's so much. And, and we're going to talk more about Bonnie Brock, particularly um, in, in, let's see, October, because um, a lot comes out in the novella and the Deadly Hours, which we're doing that month. So um, yeah, so he's an interesting character. It was a lot of fun to get to do him. Um, there's so many good scenes. And uh, I'm going to read one more excerpt, and it's very short. It's um, about the jewels. I had some people ask about that, too. So here we go. And I apologize. I'm probably not going to try to do the Scottish Brogue <laughs> because my Scottish Brogue is really bad. So I'm, I'm yeah, <laughs> you don't want to hear it. Okay. <laughs> we resumed our walk, and I wondered how far he would escort me. I had expected him to peel away as soon as our conversation was done, but he remained by my side as the trees of Charlotte Square came into view. 
A lone figure stood huddled under the branches. Why do you call him Rosy? I couldn't help but ask. Because he sure didn't smell it, Bonnie Brock pronounced drolly. I laughed, ever appreciative of Scotsman's irony. At least with nicknames like that, you knew what to expect of a man. With gentlemen, it wasn't so easy. I paused before crossing the street, staring ahead at the castle high on the hill. He waited, perhaps knowing I was coming to an important decision. You have men who specialize in larceny, don't you? He didn't answer immediately, and I turned my face to the side to look up at him. I think you can the answer to that. What's the snatch? Jewelry? I couldn't tell, I could, excuse me, I could tell I'd piqued his interest, for he shifted a step closer. Whose? An imprudent baron's. He tilted his head. How much? Enough to make it worth your while? Your proposal? I can give you the layout of the house, the position of the safe, and even a few guesses as to the combination. A percentage of the gems go to you, while the rest go to my client. We eyed each other shrewdly. And no one is to be harmed, but your men have to make it obvious there was a robbery. Bonnie Brock's eyebrows lifted toward his hairline. That's an odd request, but easily done. He, he narrowed his eyes. But I would know of branded ya procur procurus. You're full of surprises, Lady Darby. I turned to stare up at the castle again, hoping I wasn't doing the wrong thing, trusting such a task to him and his men. They were, after all, criminals. But that's why they were so perfect for the job in the first place. I frowned. Some situations call for a little improvisation. So I had mentioned in the group that um, that kind of was a, a spontaneous decision to have Kira have him help her with Lady Kirkowan's jewels. Um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to keep it after I wrote it. And then I realized I really did because it added an interesting dimension to Kira and an interesting interesting dimension to her relationship to Bonnie Brock. So um, sometimes those spontaneous things work out. So I'm going to check for more questions. Um, Becca, Becca, Becca. Um, let's see, sorry. What amount of historical research goes to the, into each book? Um, especially in a, as death draws near. Yeah, okay, so when we get to book five, um, Every book is a little different. Um, some books have a ton of research and some not so much. It depends on kind of what I'm focusing on in the book. Um, when I start a series, obviously there's a ton of research because there's all this background you have to do. And I'm constantly researching just general background things all the time when I stumble across a great book that's about that era, just because there's always more to learn. Um, you know, about the customs and the food and the way people reacted, acted and spoke and their clothing and all those, all those things. There's so many layers. Um, but then each book, it's, it's different. Um, for a study in death, I don't think I had as much research. I had to do a lot of research on poisons and plants and things from that era. Um, and the city itself and things like that. I'm trying to remember. Um, but it wasn't as much, but like, for example, they, they asked about as death draws near. I definitely had a lot of research for that because I took takes in the Ireland and there was so much, there's so much, um, most people have no clue really what the Irish are. Most Americans have no clue about Irish history in general. I mean, we just have the, oh, there's a potato famine and no, oh, there's whatever. We don't really understand the nuances and everything that's going on. Um, and so I had to do a lot of research on that and, and um, Rathfarn Ab Abbey that I use and um, the nuns, there were real nuns. Um, most of them are were real figures, especially the mother superior. Um, I read books about her and her biography and all that stuff. So yeah, so um, it depends on the book um, really. So uh, that's, all, that's all I can say. <laughs> some books is a lot, some books is not as much. So. Um, but yeah, it all, it all feeds together. I mean, I learn things in one book and then five books later, I'm like, oh, I remember I read about that and I use it. So um, would Gage inherit his father's title? Yes, Gage will inherit his father's title. It is a barony. It's, he's a baron. Um, and he will inherit his title and everything that's entailed with it. And all, well, and everything really, because he has no other children. Well, he has no other legitimate children. So um so he's basically going to inherit everything eventually. So um, I love how Lady Stratford's experience with her late evil husband and experience with Kira made her more well-rounded. Oh, good. Yes. 
she starts caring less about social norms and preference for her friendships. Yep. That's true. And yeah, it, it all comes down to, I think in general, she'd never met a woman like Kira before and, and realized she could be different. So, um, Oh, thank you that you love the description of the Spanish customs and the fashions and the food. <laughs> I know it's so funny. I get comments about my food things a lot and I am, food is not my um, strong suit. <laughs> so, so many times when I'm writing books and fashion even, I will say if I need to describe a meal or I need to describe um, a, a dress, I, I'll just put in parentheses, describe this because I, I just, it takes me too much time to find the information because I'm just not, it's not my strong suit. So my first draft, I never write any of the food stuff or the, or the dress stuff usually. And then when I come back for my second draft, I have to go find all that information and I have lists of things now, um, just to help me, you know, what dishes did they eat? And, you know, um, but it's so funny. I get comments about that and I'm like, I, I just, I find it funny because it's, I definitely will tell you it's not my strong suit, but I, I go back and I do the research when I later to make, to make it sound good. So I'm glad it works. <laughs> um, how many more times will we suspect Marsdale? Ah, you know, he's, he likes to be suspected too, huh? Um, I have plans for Marsdale to be in at least one more book, but he probably, he won't be the, he won't, will not be the suspect or probably won't be the suspect. I don't have it all worked out, but I have a, um, yeah, <laughs> I have more for Miles Dell, but yeah, he likes to be the suspect. Um, but he wasn't in this book though, at least. Um, he is nice and protective, Philip is, he's very nice. Um, let's see. Um, she, you'd love to hear Bonnie Brock's thoughts. I know. Um, I know it, it's, that's the tricky thing about writing in first person. Um, I know their thoughts, but you all don't get to. And, and so sometimes it would be fun to do, I've talked about this before, to write some of the scenes from different cages or body rocks or whoever's point of view. So we really get to, you guys get to read what they're thinking in real time. So um, Bonnie Brock is definitely extremely intrigued by Kira. And a lot of that comes from his history um, his mother, she reminds him of her mother, um, of his mother, excuse me. <laughs> um, and it's also the fact that she's an outsider. She's gone through things that most people in her position have not. She's been through trauma and suffered. And, and so he can see that in her and that she's different and that she's an outsider and they have all these things that because he kind of straddles the line he's chosen now to be in the position he is but before that I mean his father and his stepfather step his sister's father um were you know aristocrats so he's very much kind of in a in a wishy-washy position also um but he's chosen to be where he is now but um I guess to a certain extent, or he was forced there and now he's chosen it. But so he's, a, he's an interesting character and he sees Kira in a different way than he was, than anybody else sees her because of his own circumstances. So, um, yeah, so you can always listen to the replay if you're late. And, and I always put this up on YouTube also the next day. So if you prefer to watch it on a different format besides Facebook, um, was much of the chemist based on someone that's existed in that time period? Yes, it wasn't exist. It wasn't based on a specific person, but there were a lot of underground chem chemists. I mean, which are apothecaries, which are you know pharmacists um, in American terms, um, in that time period. And there was poisons all over the place. I mean, especially like I mentioned the arsenic. I mean, people bought rat poison, and and there were there were systems that were put in place. Um, from this period onward where people had to register that they bought it and all this kind of, kind of like we have to um, sign that we bought ephedrine and stuff now and um, that they were put in place so they could keep track of these things but people could lie and I mean you know so there was a lot going on and so that uh, there was definitely underground chemists so I that was part of my research for Edinburgh um yeah, yeah. If portrait painting doesn't work out, Kira can arrange burglaries. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, Lord Gage the Baron. Yes. Um, 
Okay, so Sir Anthony was was a baronet, um, which so the British noble titles. It's a little tricky. Um, there's five titles that make you technically noblemen, um, aristocrats. You know the upper, and that's duke in order: duke, marquess, and um, uh, excuse me, earl. Viscount and um, Baron. And then below that is a Baronet, which Baronets were called Sir. And then below Baronet is a Knight. So um, the Baronets were called Sir and the Knights were called Sir. And then the wives of Baronets were called Lady, whatever their last name is. That's why Kira is Lady Darby. So he was not a Baron. It's a little tricky because they sound so much the same. I mean, it's a Barony and a Baronetcy. Um, but yeah, there's some differences in the privileges they are allowed. They baronets do not hold; um, they do not have a seat in Parliament, um, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's tricky. Um, baronets they can pass their title down, but to like their um, children and that. But they, um, but knights can't. There's all these little tricky things. So it's kind of like there's a there's the five baron and Duke through Baron, there's a standard procedure of what's done, and then Baronet and Knight is, is different. So that's why when I say that um, she'll be higher ranked when Gage marries Lord Gage, um, excuse me, she'll be higher ranked when Gage inherits his father's barony, because he'll be a Baron, then she'll be Lady Gage. Um, but for now, he's just a simple mister. And so she's technically Lady Darby is higher. And that's why by courtesy, not by right, people in society still call her Lady Darby. It's the same rule that, um, uh, excuse me, when Henry VIII died, um, his last wife remarried, but she was still like ranked as a queen because um, by courtesy. So it's it's this tricky thing. So um, otherwise, she would have just been a baroness. She would have dropped all the way down. So it's by it's it's a it's a tricky thing within the British peerage. So these they're peers. The duke through barons are peers. That's what I'm trying to say. Peerage. Okay. Um. So if that makes sense. <laughs> um. Edinburgh. Yes, I hope a lot of people have added it to their list. I love Edinburgh. It is possibly my most favorite city in the world and it's so much fun to visit and I can't wait to go back and there's so much to do there and there's so many hidden things to do like that aren't the like the top touristy stuff is great but there's other things too and there's so much around there and so yeah I highly recommend if you've never been and you're looking for um suggestions so um Yeah, that's okay. I, some things don't work for some people and some, too, some things do. Someone said that the burglary conspiracy didn't work for them and I, that's fine, you know. So I, I know it works for some and some for others. Um, and but I, for me at that situation, it was that, you know, she really wanted to stand up for Lydia Kirkow and understanding where she was. And it ended up working to my advantage to be able to use it in book nine. So um. Oh, you feel like Marsdale and Jock would be a hilarious duo. <laughs> Spinoff novella. That could work. <laughs> yeah, Jock, um, her cousin, who is in A Great Batter, and he's in the novella, which we'll be doing next month, and some other things. Um, I've always wanted to do more with him. I just got to find the right situation. But yeah, he is a hoot. Um, and him and Marsdale pro would probably be pretty funny together. So maybe. We'll see. I'll have to keep that in mind, because that could be pretty funny. Um, um, I love you all discussing the burglary thing. Like, yeah, it's great. I love it when people have different opinions and they can talk about it. That it's exciting to me that people would want to do that. Um, let's see. What is Kira's obsession with what happened to Gage in Greece? Um, why is it important that he that he tell her? So for her, it's a matter of him sharing everything about her, himself. She can tell that he is holding something back and it was something very important. There, she can tell that something very important happened to him in Greece that affected who he is. And he's not sharing with it with her, but they're about to get married. She's told him her 
him her deepest, darkest secrets about, you know, she's not gone into all detail of what Sir Anthony did, but he knows, you know, and, he, but he hasn't shared this with her. And so it makes her nervous. I mean, obviously from her first marriage and the fact that she's going to be marrying Gage and he's going to have the power now and he can do whatever, um, but he's not sharing. And so it, it just makes her nervous. She wants to know, she wants to know why he won't share it with her and what it is. And so that's why it's an obsession with her. Um, I think all of us would, would kind of, would feel the same way. If we were getting ready to marry a guy and we know something happened to him and it was extremely important and it really shaped who they were and we find out there's a woman involved and he won't share it with us, we would definitely be suspicious, you know? So, um, so that's basically where it, where it comes from and why it was so important for her to have to know. Uh, and let's see. I know Kira's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yes. She's definitely coming into her own. Um, realizing she's strong and that she can help others and that, you know, she can make a difference. So. Um, Yeah. So anyway, any other questions, go ahead and pop them in. Um, I'm going to check my notes because I think there were some. Oh, yes, I did want to mention um, Lord Henry Care shows up in this book. It's the first time we may, meet him. Um, they He was Lady Drummond's um, significant, wasn't her lover. They never were physical, but her um, they were romantic. They were um, emotionally involved. Um, they interview him at the um, Theodore Royale. And uh, this is the first time we meet him. And of course, he, you know, appears in book eight again, and nine, and he's in 10. And we find out he's significantly, um, he's significant to Gage. So um, I'm trying not to spoil it too much in case there's people here that haven't read all the books in the series yet. But um, those of you had no. So, <laughs> so yes, that is the same person. So it's the first time we meet him. And it's, it's funny. Um, I wrote his character. It's a very brief scene, really. And I wanted to come back to him and I wanted to know about his family and, and his mother, the Duchess. We learned she's pretty infamous. And I initially toyed with the idea of writing a separate series about that family. And then I decided instead to work them into um, Lady Darby. Um, I had not decided that Lord Henry would have a significant um, connection to Gage at this point in writing. I did not decide that actually until in what I was writing book eight um, in the middle of it. So, um, and I, I just liked, I loved it because it answered some questions that I, I personally had about Lord Gage and some other things. Um, and so that that just all worked together. So, and I, I was glad that I got to explore his character and add him in, and we're gonna continue to explore him. So, um, yeah, so that's all the notes I had, but if you have questions, I'm gonna keep checking here for a minute. Um, yes, Gage's ballet, I know Anderley, they gradually and gradually, he and Bree have more of a role in their investigations and in their lives. And um, well, Andrew Lee did all along, and but Kira just didn't know about it. Obviously, that's something that she wouldn't have. Um, and I love in book five, we really get to have that kick in um, now that they're married um, and see his significant contribution. And so, um, you know, and there's a scene in A Grave Matter that's good between them. But yeah. Um, it's a lot of fun to get to explore that dynamic. And they also play significant roles later too. Um, I got to explore some interesting things with Angelie in book 10 um, that you guys will get to read next year. So um, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. These are my characters. They live in my imagination, but there's things I'm always discovering about them. And I, I, I love that that makes them real to me so that hopefully I can make them real for you. So um. <laughs> you love, yes, Kira has definitely an opinion about the fashions and the poof sleeves, the gigo sleeves. Um, I don't know. I never read anything about that, that it was an issue for women. But looking at these pictures, I mean, if you look at the fashion plates of what the women wore and how immensely large these sleeves were and how they get really ridiculous and then they shrink back down, all I can think of is 
there had to be women that were like, these are awful. Why are we wearing this? You know what I mean? Like even now, you know, people will go along with fashion trends, but there are always people that are like, why are we wearing this? You know, so um, Kira's not a fashion Nisa to begin with. And then these sleeves, she's just like, what the world? Like, and she can't paint in them and she can't, you know, they're, they, they get pretty, pretty ridiculous. They keep growing. So <laughs> they don't shrink down till about the mid part of the, 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 um, century. So or not century, a uh, decade, excuse me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I had to throw that in there because my first thought is this might be one of the ugliest periods of fashion. <laughs> at least in modern, you know, the last 300 years, but, but, um, and it happens to be this, <laughs> happens to be the era I'm riding in. So I like to poke a little fun at it. There are some gorgeous dresses, not all of it's ugly, but it's a weird trend to me that, that, you know, I just, I just have never, I can't relate to. So, um, <laughs> Oh, you've ever have, I have to look that up, Linda. You'll have to show me where the satirists pick up on that because I have not seen that. I've seen all the fashion plates and how they, people, you know, describe all these dresses elaborately and things, but I've not seen the satirists. Let's see. Oh yeah, I know I have. I have seen them. Yes. The like in the magazines and the, the, yes, they would hang them up and they would make fun, like when they would make fun of the men with their corsets and, and different things. So you're right. They did, they did quite have a lot of fun. And then you know, the men with their corsets and the women earlier in the Regency and that were wetting their gowns. And yeah, um, they did have fun with that. I didn't think about that. Let's see. Um, when we when will we learn more about Gage Sr., <laughs> yes, Lord Gage plays a huge part in book 11. So not next year, but the year after, um, you will, we will learn much, much, much more about Lord Gage and his past. We really get to delve into him. Um, yeah, there's every era, there's always some fashion that, <laughs> um, have you used paints or been in studios to get a firsthand, um, experience, I can experience, um, I love how you describe it, um, and others reaction. Um, I have, uh, secondhand more than first. I mean, a little bit of first, but more secondhand. I have artists in my family that I've been able to talk to and I, and I read a lot about um, historically um, artists and things. And I also kind of look at it from the standpoint of, you know, I'm, I'm a musician. So to me, it's a different art, but it's still that artist mindset. Um, and I think about, I, I try, I think all artists have a certain mindset, whether, whether you work with um, paint or music or um, food or whatever. Um, and so I try to think, you know, there's certain things that activate, I mean, like as an author, you know, smelling old books and, you know, I, I and, and there's certain ink and certain things like it just, you know, so that what would an artist, what smells would an artist, you know, come alive to them? Other people would think, oh, this is awful. But for them, it's just the way they, the way they work, they, they get used to it. I mean, even like as anatomists and doctors, they eventually or forensics you know they, they eventually get used to these horrible smells I mean they don't get used to them but I mean they stomach them better because they're just accustomed to them you know so um it was it's kind of all thinking of it in those terms um but yeah so it's a uh, secondhand and from families and friends and just also using an, a mindset of of an artist to try to really capture um Kira and who how she thinks um Will book 11 go to Cornwall? No, book 11 is not going to be in Cornwall, although I have intentions for Cornwall. So um, trying not to spoil too much, but um, yeah, book 11 is not Cornwall. You will find out by the end of book 10 what's happening for book 11. I, I'll give you that. So um, some books, I usually end books with a little hint about the next book. Um, some are more vague than others, but the end of book 10 will definitely tell you what's happening in book 11. <laughs> it's one of those ones that will be no vagary. <laughs> So, um, oh, Brie and Anderley, yes, I, and I will address that more as we, um, get later in the series, um, with the read-along, but yeah, um, there, there's more to come for them, I will say that, so I can't really give away too much, um, how did Gage wind up with a home in Edinburgh, um, well, he doesn't have a home, um, yet, um, in a study in death, he's just renting rooms, um, at like a men's rooming house, uh, like a rooming house, um, which bachelors would do. Um, he buys the home 
we find out in the net in the novella for Kira, basically, so that there's a home near they have a townhouse near um where Alana and Philip have a townhouse in Edinburgh. So um and he already has a home in London, which we visit in book seven. So um he's wealthy. Let's just put it that way. He he inherited money from his mother, grandfather, maternal grandfather, and made himself he's independent, really wealthy. And then his father is very wealthy. Also, he has a stipend from him. That's the standard procedure that would have happened um, because his father, not necessarily that he was granted the title and a bunch of money, but because he was a Royal Navy captain and they, when they took ships and prizes, they got a certain amount of that money. And so a lot of um, captains and officers in the Royal Navy through the Napoleonic Wars and other times um, made fortunes that way. We learned about that a little bit in Persuasion with Jane Austen. So um, anyway, so it's an interesting kind of, um, he comes to his money in a different way. So engage his money comes from different sources. So yeah, he's definitely wealthy, which makes it easier for me to bounce them around and put them places. So um, definitely, <laughs> if you have money, it's a little easier to move people around. So um, so I think that's all for now. Um, if I missed your question, I'm sorry. And, and um, just, you know, I guess message me and I will try to answer it for you if you really want to know or or keep it for next month and I can answer it then. So, but this was a lot of fun. I'm glad you guys could join me. Um, I'm super excited. We'll be starting the novella, which comes first. I think of it kind of as 4.5, um, a pressing engagement. Um, we'll be starting that tomorrow. Um, and I'll be having the event for that on September 16th. Um, Yes, it's only available by ebook, and I realize that, and it's a frustration for some people. Um, that's out of my hands. I have no control. Um, that's the publisher's decision completely, and I also understand from their point the cost. It's a, it's a short book. It's about a quarter the size of a regular book, and so for them, the cost of printing it is not worth it, so that's why it's just an ebook, and it's I purposely tried to keep the content in that book so that you could skip it and not be confused when you get to book five um, because I knew that not everybody likes reading electronic. So if you are one of those people, I'm sorry. I mean, there's nothing I could do. Um, if you do want to read it and don't have a copy, you can get it at any ebook retailer. I think you can borrow it from the libraries for free. Um, and you don't have to have an e-reader. You can read it on a, you can download the um, Kindle Nook, whatever app to, um, any electronic device, um, or you can read it straight online at a lot of those places. Also, they have um, platforms to do that. So um, hopefully, if you want to join us, you can get your hands on a copy. And if not, I, I apologize. So, uh, but like I said, it's out of my hands. I'm hoping someday there will be a print copy, but at this point, there's not. So um, I do want to mention that um, I'm kind of shifting gears. I'm glad we're doing the novella this month because it, it's um, shorter and I will be very busy with the release of um, Murder Most Fair, um, Verity Kent book five, which my author copies just came to today. So I'm super excited about that. Um, and they're gorgeous. Love them. <laughs> um, so that comes out August 31st. And I have a lot of events coming up um, for that. Um, I want to mention also next week, um, I have Olivia Matthews joining me. Um, she's a wonderful author, a mystery author, for my author chat um, on the 18th at 8 p.m. So mark your calendars. I hope you'll um, pop in and um, get to hear about Olivia. Um, she is great fun. Um, and uh, as far as my events for the Murder Rose Fair, they're all on my website. It's easy to check. Um, I've got something coming up with Jane Ann Krentz and Victoria Thompson and Alyssa Maxwell, um, Anna, or excuse me, Claire McKenna, um, Erica Ruth Neubauer. So I'm, join I'm joining forces with a couple different authors. And also there is a big, I have to tell you about this. On release night, August 31st, there is a big um, release event with, 12 or 13 other Kensington, that's our publisher's authors, we're all teaming up to have this big Facebook release party. Um, check on my website for the link so you can RSVP so you don't miss it because there's going to be a ton of wonderful, wonderful giveaways. And I have three that are that I'll be giving away pa prize packs. Um, and I'll be posting pictures of all that kind of stuff coming up, building up to it. So be sure to RSVP so you don't miss that because you will love meeting these authors and 
getting to find out about their books, but also a chance to win these wonderful prize packs. So, and there's a big, huge prize pack from our publisher that will have all the books. Um, so you could score a, a great load of great mysteries. So um, be sure to check that out. And I think that's everything I needed to remind you of. I have all this whole list. There was a whole bunch of stuff tonight for some reason. So um, I'm glad you guys enjoy joining me for these. And it's been a lot of fun to get to, to revisit these Lady Darby novels. Um, I haven't read some of them for years, reread re some of them for years. So um, it's been a lot of fun. And it's and it's also been interesting to see how the past connects with what I'm writing now. And, and even though I know it, just things, little things that I've forgotten. So um, lots of fun. So I look forward to joining y'all next, uh, next week and next month. <laughs> lots coming up. So um, I hope you will make plans to check those out. And I hope you guys all have a wonderful um, evening and a great night.